So hi, everyone. I'm Max Nospish, Manager of Visitor Experiences at the First Amendment Museum. Thank you all for tuning in tonight for Brewing a Boycott with Dr. Allison Brantley. If this is your first time joining the First Amendment Museum for one of our online speaker series, we are a fiercely nonpartisan museum located in Augusta, Maine, dedicated to promoting the understanding and use of the First Amendment so that all may reap the benefits. As a nonprofit, we rely on generous donations from viewers like you, so consider donating to us today. If you're watching this at a later date on our YouTube channel, please check out the First Amendment Museum's website and consider donating. Thank you. Now, this evening, we're joined by Allison Brantley, Assistant Professor of History and Doc Director of Honors and Interdisciplinary Initiatives at the University of Laverne in Laverne, California. Brantley writes and teaches about consumer society and politics, Latino and labor histories, the United States-Mexico borderlands, and the history of beer and brewing in the United States. So I hope you all brought your favorite beer for tonight. Uh, Brantley is the author of Brewing a Boycott, How a Grassroots Coalition Fought Coors and Remade American Consumer Activism. Through her own original research and organizational records, activist publications, and oral histories, Brantley's book uh, positions the consumer campaign against Coors beer at the center of late 20th century political culture and social movements. After Professor Brantley's presentation tonight, join us for a live Q&A where you, the audience, will have the opportunity to ask any questions you might have for her. We hope to see you then, and Professor Brantley, thank you for joining us. Thank you so much for having me, Max. Um, hi, everyone. Thank you for being here this afternoon slash evening. I'm in Los Angeles, so it's very much still uh, the afternoon. Uh, I'm going to go ahead and share my screen. I like to share slides when I give a talk about this book, um, in part because I found a great deal of um, ephemera and visual things in my research that never made it into the book. So this is a good opportunity for me to share those items uh, with, with an audience. Um, hold on, I'm just going to make sure I have everything arranged. Thank you for your patience. Uh, so it's really great to have the opportunity to share with you today the, the story of the Coors boycott, uh, especially since the right to boycott, the, the right to boycott and petition uh, certainly falls under our First Amendment rights and protections. And, and so today the, the plan for me is to offer an overview of the history of the Coors boycott itself. Uh, in its long history, it lasted from the late 1950s to the late 1990s in the United States. And I also uh, will, will end by discussing what I think this history tells us about the consumer boycott as a tool of solidarity, political organizing, and importantly, a tool of free speech. So a little bit of background here. Uh, Brewing a Boycott, you can see the cover, uh, details a nearly 50 year boycott of the Colorado based Coors Brewing Company, best known for its beers like Coors Heavy, Coors Light, Keystone, and some of its other spin off products. Uh, while, while you might know the beer, as the silver bullet or for its very, very cold cans. Uh, to me, Coors reminds me of home. I grew up in Boulder, Colorado. That's about 20 miles north of Coors's flagship brewery, which is in a small former mining boom town of Golden, Colorado. And the name, the brand and the beer are everywhere in the state of Colorado. Some of the first sporting events I attended were in stadiums that bore the Coors name. As a kid, as we would drive to the mountains, you would always see the brewery smokestacks just before the interstate turned west to take you to ski areas in the Rocky Mountains. And admittedly, in my house, chances were that there were cans of Coors Light hiding in the back of the fridge. They were my parents, it was my parents' favorite drink, uh, or a favorite um, after work drink, I guess I should say. So it's also worth mentioning that Coors and the Coors family not only have a significant cultural presence in the state and you see the beer everywhere, the name is everywhere, but there have, but the family has also been a really prominent and conservative force in the state's economy and politics. And so the name and the family loom large um, and they loomed large in my childhood and in, in my um, youth, basically growing up in the state, it was everywhere. And when I got to graduate school, interestingly enough, Coors popped up again, but in a very different context and in a very different light. Uh, this time it was in a book uh, with a brief mention of Mexican Americans in Colorado who boycotted the beer because of discriminatory practices in the 1960s 
and in the 1970s. And, and actually the top bumper sticker here, um, no compre cours, don't buy cours, is one of the, the items that this boycott produced. And so this really caught my attention and honestly my surprise. And, and so I was interested to dig a little bit deeper. And what started as a small research project turned into about a decade of work, which included, as, as Max mentioned at the top, research in archives across the nation from San Francisco to Detroit to New York. And I conducted oral histories, uh, oral history interviews with activists involved in the boycott. And eventually all of that came together to my book, which was published about a year ago today. Now in the process of this research and then writing, what I encountered about this boycott uh, was that it was a strikingly diverse long-lasting and geographically expansive consumer campaign. It wasn't actually simply this, this moment of boycotting by Mexican Americans in the 60s. It, it turned out it was a much bigger history and a much bigger movement. It was a boycott movement that actually brought together queer activists, Chicanos and Latinos, Black activists, union members, college students, feminists, environmentalists, and a wide array of progressive activists. Between the 1950s and the 1990s, and actually maybe into the present, uh, activists and organizers from these various backgrounds worked in coalition to reimagine the potential of the consumer boycott to make real change, both for their own communities and in a broader political sense. Uh, so together, targeting cores for an, a wide range of offenses and grievances, which I'll get into, they built a movement that is perhaps best described as a series of intersecting and overlapping boycott episodes that played out over the course of four or five decades. Initially, activists took aim at Coors for the company's anti-union practices. Then um, they added a complaint, and a very significant one at that, of allegations of employment discrimination at the brewery. Over time, boycott narratives expanded to include political grievances against the Coors family and by extension, the new right, which was uh, you know, in ascendance in the 1980s and beyond. And so motivated by these three narratives, boycott activities popped up in cities across the United States, from Los Angeles to Albuquerque to Boston, where activists would rally in March, like you see here. They would slap some brightly colored bumper stickers on their cars. They'd wear buttons or t-shirts. They'd pass out flyers. They'd encourage friends at parties to avoid the beer. And they'd even have gatherings to unceremoniously dump out Coors beer. And so it was at this nexus of activism and coalition building and consumer organizing uh, where my research and writing focused. I, I was really interested in the people at the grassroots who were building this consumer campaign and indeed sustaining it for a really long time. And, and so I focused on questions of who's boycotting, why were they boycotting, how are they coming together, and, and maybe the biggest question of all, how are they using the boycott tool as a way to express themselves and engage in political organizing? And so I'll walk you through the answers I found to some of those questions and, and bring us a little bit deeper into this longstanding boycott movement. So, so why and how did activists boycott Coors Beer? What started it all? Um, the way that activists would answer this question by the 1970s or 1980s would be a three-pronged answer. For them, they saw the boycott as centering on anti-union or anti-labor practices at the brewery, and you can see the flagship brewery there. They would focus on discrimination against people of color and gay and lesbian employees. And they would also focus on the politics of the Coors family. And, and when those three narratives combined, the boycott really gained significant momentum and brought in a lot of different backers. But the initial boycott began in the 1950s in Golden, Colorado, the home of Coors Beer. And it focused specifically on grievances and frustrations about work and labor management relations in the flagship brewery. The photograph on the slide is from the 1970s or so. And I think what you can see is that the operation is not like how we imagine maybe a craft brewery or microbrewery today. Instead, it's really a a massive operation, more factory-like than anything else. And this massive operation, the, the factory production of beer, uh, really began in the post-World War II period when the Coors Brewery underwent a significant transition. So Coors itself was founded in 1873 
by a Prussian immigrant, immigrant and refugee, Adolf Coors Sr. And the brewery itself had long been a really local brewery. It served a local market of Denver and surrounding mountain towns. The brewery was able to survive the ordeal of prohibition. And then under second and third, a second and third generation of Coors men, and they were all men, uh, Coors began to expand its brewing and production capacity. And in this process, Coors was competing with other expanding breweries in the country like Miller, Pabst, and Anheuser-Busch, and they were all competing for a growing market share because in the aftermath of World War II, more and more Americans were drinking beer. So there was a growing and expanding consumer market that the company was trying to get its product to. So Coors began distributing or selling its beer in nearby states in the American West. Um, the distribution was limited and exclusive, however, to places, you know, really only west of the Mississippi because Coors beer was cold filtered rather than pasteurized, uh, meaning that the company had to restrict its distribution to a radius in which they could ensure the beer would remain cold and wouldn't heat up. Uh, but as the brewery expanded its production and distribution and, and kind of morphed into this uh, massive manufacturing facility that you see, uh, it needed more employees. But increasingly by the 1950s, there were tense relations with employees, many of whom were unionized. Um, at the brewery and in its growing distribution network, Union members and workers at Coors complained that they had limited agency on the job, um, that they often had unpredictable work schedules, sometimes unsafe work schedules. Occasionally they were subjected to mandatory polygraph tests, a practice that would increase in frequency over the years. And they found themselves in rather contentious standoffs with management in strikes. Um, brewery maintenance and production workers who worked on the floor of the brewery were members of Local 366. They went on strike in the summer of 1957 um, and, and faced a really contentious standoff with the company and only barely got back into the brewery. Uh, in the same way, in the 1960s, beer drivers in California who were unionized under the Teamsters went on strike again and again against the company and found themselves facing a really um, intransigent management team. Uh, additional workers around Coors, like pipe fitters we see here, also complained of similar issues, including, um, as you can see this guy, um, noting substandard wages. And so by the 50s and 60s, unions and management at Coors were consistently standing off in pretty tense um, strikes and negotiations. And so in these standoffs, union members began to articulate a really foundational narrative for the boycott, that the company was inherently anti-union. They believed that the management of the company did not want unions in their facilities and would do anything to oust unions. Um, so, so they would. So these boycotters focused on the anti-union message in their initial boycotts and warned others that if they didn't boycott Coors Beer, this sickness of anti-unionism could spread to their facilities as well. So the first calls to boycott begin in the late 1950s, and they focus on this first narrative of anti-unionism. But of course, the, the boycott expands beyond this. In the 1960s, activists in Colorado built on this labor argument with racial justice boycotts. And, and for them, the focus was not on union rights at Coors, but just getting their foot in the door to get a job at Coors. Uh, throughout Colorado, there were widespread allegations of discrimination at the brewery, that, that if you were a person of color, you, you might not even get hired really, and, and the rates of employment for people of color were quite low in Colorado. Or if you did get a job at the brewery, you'd be put into a low-skilled, low-paying position. Or if you're a woman, there was no way you could get a job in the brewery. You could only really be hired at the clerical level. So there were some complaints that the company was not hiring um, in, in an equitable way, especially after the passage of the Civil Rights Act in 1964. So activists um, were concerned about equity in hiring, and there were also increasing concerns about the company's use of lie detector tests. By the 1960s and into the 70s, uh, the company made polygraph tests mandatory for uh, employment. So once you passed a couple steps of interviewing for the job, you'd have to be hooked up to a lie detector test. Former employees noted that the, the lie detector test included questions about one's sexuality. And so there was this feeling in Colorado uh, by activists and 
um, aspiring Coors workers, that the company was curating its workforce to be largely white, male, and straight. And so activists, especially Mexican Americans or Chicanos in the Denver area, uh, began to target the company and develop an argument that the company and the family were discriminatory or more to the point racist. And you can see that in the imagery here. Um, in particular, the, the sketch on the left is a play on Coors' real can saying, Coors is a fine racist family, and below it says that the beer is brewed with the blood of Chicanos. So, so radical Mexican-Americans who describe themselves as Chicanos uh, started to focus on the company's discriminatory practices and connections to a broader environment of discrimination in Colorado. Many activists at first tried to get uh, the company to change its employment practices by going through the bureaucratic institutions like the Equal Employment Opportunities Commission, a lot of those efforts fell short. And so increasingly the boycott among Chicanos in particular became confrontational and radical. And it really became a rallying cry for sort of militant um, cultural nationalistic Chicano activism. Chicano college students in particular took up the banner of the boycott and for them, Boycotting Coors became a key piece of a Chicano activist identity. And they essentially argued that to be a true Chicano was to boycott Coors, as well as, for example, scab, or to boycott scab grapes or Frito chips. And that was an expression of cultural pride and solidarity. Uh, the image on the, the right is from a protest in the 1970s in Denver. And, and what you see actually is a group called the Brown Berets. They were sort of the Chicano equivalent of the Black Panthers. And I love the, the image of the little girl, the, the, the call that she's carrying on her sign says, Chicanos boycott Coors. It's both a, a demand, right, to other Chicanos that you must boycott Coors uh, in order to push forward our struggle for racial justice. But then it's also an assertion that all Chicanos did boycott Coors. And so this, this argument about the hiring practices of the company and its discriminatory nature also were grafted onto this boycott by the 1960s. In the 1970s as well, uh, boycott calls expanded and brought more activists in as um, there was an emergence of activism that focused closely on the Coors family's politics. In particular, activists uh, focused on the public political activities of the man pictured on the left. His name is Joseph Coors. He's one of the third generation Coors executives. And he had become increasingly public in his support for the conservative uh, new right movement. Um, and, and activists were really concerned that he was essentially using company profits and people's beer money to fund the conservative movement. Uh, for example, Joe Coors helped to provide initial funding for the conservative think tank, the Heritage Foundation. Uh, Joe Coors and a, a few other people worked to establish a short-lived new TV station to counter liberal bias in the media. And most significantly, Coors provided significant funding and support for Ronald Reagan's campaigns for president in 1976 and then 1980. And so Coors himself became increasingly connected to the new right. And that was a problem for many boycotters. They, they believed then that their boycott of Coors beer was a vote against this kind of political activity. Um, I also like this image on the right that sort of graphs the bottle of Coors beer onto politics in a, in a visual way. And so as the Boston Globe wrote in the early 1980s, uh, because of all of this, basically anyone on the left could find something to gripe about when it came to Coors. So increasingly, about 20 years into this boycott, there was a convergence of three narratives that the company was anti-union, that the company was discriminatory, and the company and, and family were deeply linked to the new right. And the convergence of these three narratives produced new interracial coalitions where different groups were coming together in service of the boycott and, and building new relationships because of the boycott. Uh, these coalitions emerged out of pragmatism, but also mutual commitments and ideas of long distance solidarity. And so I'll highlight three different moments of coalition that I, I think exemplify this and also tell us a little bit about the evolution of this boycott. So in the early to mid 1970s in San Francisco is one example that uh, has gained a lot of attention actually in, re in recent years. Uh, 
um, and was actually highlighted in the movie Milk, which came out a number of years ago. And in this case, uh, beer drivers who were unionized with the Teamsters Union went on strike against the local Coors distributor. Um, they argued that the, the Coors distributor wasn't bargaining in good faith about wages, and so they decide to just walk off the job. And one of the things they do, which a lot of labor unions did, was they went on strike and then immediately added a boycott to their repertoire of tactics or toolbox of protest tactics. But initially, this boycott just wasn't really making any headway in San Francisco. And, and organizers like the man featured on the left in the photo, Alan Baird, became a little bit worried about the state of the boycott. So he and others decided that they needed to build mutual alliances with other activist communities, especially since other people were talking about boycotting course. And at first, they were really unsuccessful uh, at this. The Teamsters went to Black Panthers, to Chicano organizations, and because of the Teamsters um, rather poor reputation, one could say uh, there wasn't much made out of these initial um, efforts at outreach. Uh, but eventually Alan Baird and others decided to um, offer mutual commitments to other communities. They didn't give up. Uh, they ended up putting together affirmative action programs and or affirmative action proposals to bring people of color and queer people into their union. And they built really um, reciprocal and lasting relationships eventually with organizations like the Black Panther Party, Native American activists, Chicanos, and gay and lesbian activists in San Francisco. And so key in this movement uh, was Harvey Milk, the politician who's in this image on the right, as well as a, a gay socialist activist named Howard Wallace and his, his organization known as the Bay Area Gay Liberation. And, and, and so in the mid 1970s, what began as a labor-based boycott uh, for Teamsters ended up growing into this really robust coalition backed boycott. Uh, the people who were participating in it were excited about the coalition building and visually marked it in their poster, which we see here. The media remarked that this was a nearly impossible or unimaginable alliance that had been built. And so the Coors boycott was a platform for bringing these various groups together. And increasingly, the boycott was known as a coalition-backed campaign wherever it popped up. Another key moment in this history and another key moment of coalition building uh, was in the late 1970s when the union at the Coors Brewery in Golden, Local 366, went on strike yet again. And, and they went on strike and entered into an 18 month labor standoff with the company. Uh, they argued that their strike was, and you can see this on the, the left, uh, because of unfair labor practices. They note the polygraph. And they argue that their fight against Coors is really a human rights struggle for dignity on the job. Uh, so they go on strike against Coors and workers know that it will be a tough one. They sense that the company wants to use the strike as a way to oust the union. And so organizers turned quickly to the boycott. Uh, they believed that amplifying the call to boycott Coors beer would be the most effective tool for combating an, a union busting firm like Coors. Uh, organizers with Local 366 immediately went to work. Uh, many of them spread out across the, the West, wherever Coors was distributed, and worked to build coalitions in cities like Los Angeles, Albuquerque, and Austin. And they were able to build uh, robust coalitions that brought together a variety of different groups who'd already been boycotting Coors themselves. Unfortunately, even though this piece of the boycott uh, experiences a really creative coalition building, the company itself uh, was too big of a match basically for the union. Eventually the union was decertified, meaning it was voted out in December of 1978, um, signaling a, a really significant and difficult loss for many of the workers in the brewery. Uh, but instead of giving up, they continued their boycott efforts. Uh, boycotters noted that now the company was not just suspected of being an anti-union or union busting firm, but now it was clearly a proven union buster. And so the boycott continued into the 1980s where it went national and really exemplified um, some creative organizing that was happening among progressives in the era of the Reagan administration. So in the 1980s, the boycott went national. It expanded beyond the American West and it increasingly brought in a, a wide array of different arguments against the company. Um, in this era, the era after the strike, uh, 
boycotters faced off against a company that was increasingly rebranding itself. Um, it was trying to fight the boycott more and more by funneling hundreds of millions of dollars into communities of color to undercut the boycott. And the company itself was finally expanding its distribution beyond um, the Mississippi and, and extending into the, the East. So for those of you on the East Coast, Coors didn't arrive until the early 1980s. And when it did, boycotters were ready for them. Uh, the boycott really followed the, the company as it expanded. Um, they often activated coalitions across the country before the first trucks of Coors even arrived. Uh, usually these coalitions were made up of uh, labor unions and, and labor organizations, Chicano or Latino activists and gay and lesbian activists. And, and those groups usually came together uh, to prepare for the arrival of Coors and to build a boycott coalition in their respective cities. So you can get a sense of the cities um, that ended up being swept up in this boycott by some of these images. Uh, the boycott made it to New York City in the early 1980s, uh, where actually the, the, the beer was ousted or banned from Yankee Stadium. The same goes for the cities of Hartford and Boston. Um, this, this sticker here indicates something that happened, which was what Fenway Park also banned Coors from being sold in, in the, the stadium. Um, also, I should add the cities of New York and Boston both passed city council resolutions supporting the boycott. So there's clearly a lot of organizing going on in these cities, and it's motivated by these three arguments that I mentioned before. Companies' anti-unionism and discrimination, and even more prominently in the 1980s, the family's connections to the conservative movement. Um, so, so there's some pretty interesting and, and kind of robust organizing happening in these places. I, I love both of these images. And then just to give a sense of the excitement actually that some activists had when they finally had the, the true opportunity to boycott Coors. Um, this was a dump out party in New York um, in, in the West Village. And you can see them dumping out pitchers of Coors beer into the, um, the drainage, um, the, the drain at the curb in the West Village. Um, so, the, so there's a lot of momentum into the 1980s in these places where the boycott had never touched before. And so um, one of the things that I really see here and I'll touch on later is that this boycott offers a lot of points of entry for activists. It's a pretty easy thing to step into. There are a lot of ways to justify and narrate your involvement, and it's seen to be an empowering form of activism. Now, even with or maybe because of uh, these efforts, as the heat on Coors intensified, the company itself worked um, to settle high profile agreements with various boycotting communities. And one of the things that Coors' public relations team would do is that they would target certain sectors of the coalition of boycotters and kind of peel them away from the boycott with a good deal of money and, and promises of funding. So in 1984, the company settled agreements, they're called fair share agreements with black um, civil rights organizations and leaders, um, and then another agreement with Hispanic or Latino organizations and leaders. And this amounted to about $575 million in projected donations over the course of five years, if these communities would pledge to end their boycott. Additionally, by 1987, the company settled with the AFL-CIO, the National Labor Organization, not for any amount of money close to $325 million, but for a promise that they'd uh, maintain neutrality in any future organizing drives at the brewery. Uh, there was never any official agreement with gay organizations, but the company attempted to do a lot of similar um, fundraising efforts and, and wooing of boycotters by, for example, sponsoring AIDS Walk and research, gay softball leagues and the like. So even as a, the boycott expands in the 1980s, it also meets new kinds of resistance from the company. And I think we could interpret this as actually the company was moved by the boycott, that it was pushed to do something by the boycott itself. Uh, but in the end, the boycott fades and, and loses some momentum because of these efforts and settlements. Um, it's worth noting that a lot of boycotters were really upset about these settlements. They saw them as uh, basically efforts to buy out the community. They saw signatories as sellouts or vendidos. Um, and, and they really did not support any effort to end their boycott. I think they felt really attached to this consumer boycott. They believed it was a righteous movement and a righteous effort. And so for some circles, it was never really over. 
activism continued in the 1990s, uh, gay and lesbian activists in particular really focused on the company's connections to the anti-gay moral majority. In the 2000s, there was a Chicano rival, revival of the boycott in Colorado. And more recently, there have been some murmurs of Miller Coors boycotts because of the Coors family's associations with uh, Trump's reelection campaign in 2020. And, and so for those who spent years of their lives organizing the boycott, um, they still maintain they, they wouldn't be caught dead with a Coors beer. Um, as a number of them have attested, the Coors boycott meant a great deal to them in terms of building community and affirming their own activist identities in an era where conservatism was really taking root in politics in the United States. So what lessons does this kind of kaleidoscopic, um, fragmented and multi-decade history offer with regards to boycotts in the United States in terms of both their past and their future? Um, you know, I think it's worth you know, reiterating and underscoring that the Coors, Coors boycott was not really an unqualified success. It's not really even a qualified success. Um, there are internal divisions, there were missteps by organizers, and Coors's money and persistence and influence fragmented the boycott. Uh, for some boycotters, their ultimate goal was to put the company out of business. And of course, um, as we all know, that didn't happen. Um, and like many other consumer boycotts, it fell short of a sweeping victory. But I don't think that means that consumer boycotts are not worth it. Uh, any of the activists and boycott organizers I've spoken to say that the boycott was really important to them in terms of helping them clarify their activist identity, meeting other people in the movement. And they look back on it very fondly and believe it was a worthwhile um, effort. So in my book, um, I do argue that the boycott did make a difference in, in expressive ways, in building community, in building coalition, and also underscoring the, the potential of the consumer boycott tool. So, so some of these lessons, I think there are three lessons we can um, think about and, and discuss together. Uh, first, I see the boycott as really significant in terms of building solidarity in decades in which solidarity sometimes seems hard to come by, particularly the, the 1970s and the 1980s, which are often seen as eras of fragmentation after the civil rights movement. The boycott as a flexible and accessible platform for organizing offered multiple grievances against the target. Um, there are those three narratives I've talked about. And at first offered activists a really easy course of action. At first, it's just don't buy Coors or, or don't drink Coors. And then um, the, the ask is to come along with us and organize this boycott, come to a rally, come to a beer dump out party. And, and so engaging in the boycott is a way of stepping into a community and the ask is not very high for a lot of people. And so in this broad framing of the boycott and, and its welcoming framing uh, against a, a shared enemy, a variety of groups came together to build lasting relationships. And these lasting relationships went well beyond this beer boycott itself. Notably, labor organizers and queer activists in California uh, came together in 1978, for example, to fight against an anti-gay proposition on the California ballot known as the Briggs Initiative. And, and they were able to um, vote that down. And, and some of those relationships continued after that as well. So solidarity building extended beyond the life of the boycott. I also see this boycott as significant as a tool of political organizing and activism in the 70s and 80s. You know, as I mentioned before, these are decades that historians have often seen as fragmented, although more recent scholarship is seeing more multiracial coalitions under the surface. And this boycott stands among those multiracial coalitions. As the boycott evolved and evolved in step um, with the evolution and activities of the Coors company and family, it transformed into much more than a labor dispute or a racial justice tool. Instead, it became a vector for political protest. The boycott itself, a boycott of a, a famous family or famous company became a way for people to register their discontent with the politics of the moment. So the boycott offered another way of expressing political opposition in addition to electoral politics and other forms of organizing. So if the Coors family, was a symbol of conservatism or Reaganism, especially by the 1980s. Uh, 
uh, the boycott also became an accessible symbol of resistance. So to, to stand in solidarity with the boycott of Coors Beer was to position oneself as in opposition to a whole set of conservative politics. Um, you know, in the same way, this is like today, you don't really, or people don't really boycott Chick-fil-A because they don't like chicken sandwiches, sort of besides the point. Um, it's more about the politics of the executive. So the boycott becomes a way to express discontent about a set of political beliefs um, that extends beyond traditional political activism. And so I see this boycott and, and others like it as really highlighting the creativity and the, the frustrations of progressive activism in these decades of the late 20th century. Um, the boycott of a conservative company thus became a viable form of organizing. And, and finally, I think one thing that this boycott highlights and underscores is the importance of the consumer boycott tool as an expression of free speech. Uh, one thing that's really interesting to me about this boycott and its long life is that it came of age in the 1980s as the courts upheld and firmly upheld a consumer's right to boycott, um, making this form of activism all the more viable and impactful. So in 1982, um, the significant court case that, that upholds and enshrines the right to boycott is the NAACP versus Claiborne Hardware Company um, case. And in this case, a group of white business owners in Mississippi who themselves had been targets of a 1966 boycott by um, civil rights activists in the NAACP ended up accusing activists, boycotters in the NAACP of restraint of trade and sued them for damages for lost um, profit during this boycott. Now, initially, the state Supreme Court in Mississippi sided with the business owners. The Supreme Court overturned that decision. In 1982, uh, the court ruled that the right of a state to, quote, regulate economic activity could not justify a complete prohibition against a nonviolent, politically motivated boycott. So in other words, the state could regulate economic activity, but they couldn't um, outlaw or push back against boycott because against boycotts because boycotts were protected speech. So this case has been heralded as a resounding affirmation of the consumer's right to boycott. Consumer Coors boycotters at the time were really enthusiastic about this case because for a long time they had been sort of treading um, in this, maybe sort of treading in water, treading water, not knowing whether or not their uh, boycott was protected speech. And the company continued to file suit against them um, for doing what they saw as illegal boycott activity. So this case in 1982 makes a big difference for Coors boycotters. And it also makes a big difference for anyone who wanted to engage in a consumer boycott. The case itself shifted the legal understanding of organized non-consumption from an idea that it was just an implement of the mob um, to what Justice John Paul Stevens referred to as a, quote, majestic tool. And he, in fact, concluded in his decision, quote, through speech, assembly, and petition, rather than through riot or revolution, petitioners sought to change a social order that has consistently treated them as second-class citizens. So in, in this decision, the boycott is positioned as sort of a respectable form of um, expression and, and form of activism. And so other concurrent and subsequent cases built upon and clarified this right and therefore em empowered Coors boycotters to engage in their movement. In 1980, for example, a couple of years before the Claiborne case, um, in Missouri versus the National Organization of Women, uh, the courts again supported the consumer's right to boycott. But the state of Missouri actually accused the National Organization of Women, or now, of violating the Sherman Antitrust Act in their efforts to boycott the state for not ratifying the ERA, the Equal Rights Amendment. Uh, and a federal judge in Kansas City ended up ruling in favor of now noting that, quote, the right, of, the right to petition is of such importance that it is not an improper interference even when exercised by way of boycott. And both of these cases, the Claiborne case, which is really the, the cornerstone of consumer boycott rights and the Missouri versus Now case, uh, enabled Coors boycotters to win suits against the Coors Brewing Company because in 1983 and 1985, Coors tried this antitrust argument, accusing two individuals, Dave Sickler and uh, Howard Wallace, of engaging in, in restraint of trade or violating antitrust laws in their boycott organizing. Um, 
And this was an argument that the courts also struck down, um, citing these various other cases. And, and so the Coors boycott really comes into its own, protected by these court cases. It is worth noting that some boycotts have been defined as restraint of trade or antitrust, uh, like not working until pay rates grow, go up, like not as a strike, but, uh, but more as a sort of self-defined boycott. This was a 1990 case where um, trial lawyers tried to stop taking cases until they got more money. And the courts ruled that that was actually an exercise of um, restraining trade. So the courts have really carved out consumer boycotts as a protected form of speech um, in most cases. And since 2017, the courts have upheld this right. Uh, they've blocked anti-boycott laws in Kansas, Arizona, and most recently in Arkansas, in the Arkansas Times LP versus Waldrip case. Um, and, and all of these laws that have been struck down so, had been seeking to ban support for boycott, divestment, and sanction campaigns against Israel. And so what we see from these cases and from the long history of the Coors boycott is that the consumer boycott and the, the right to boycott is a protected form of free speech. It's a form of petition that is um, open to any and all who want to engage in it. And it's a form of activism that's incredibly flexible. And the Coors boycott has demonstrated that in all of its different iterations, um, that, that the boycott itself is a viable form of expressing political opposition, building solidarity, and even um, choosing to reject a certain brand of beer. <laughs> and so to, to wrap up, I'll add, if it's not clear already, that uh, I'm a bit of an optimist. Um, through all this research, I believe that boycotts and coalitions can be really powerful tools and they can transform those who organize and sustain them. Um, even if they're not successful in the end in, in winning sort of an economic battle, they win other battles in terms of political organizing and solidarity. And so with that, uh, I will wrap up. Uh, thank you so much for being here and listening and watching. And I'm happy to hear others' thoughts and answer any questions you might have. Awesome, sure. Allison, thank you so much. Uh, that was great. Thanks. Yeah, so let me pin myself real quick. Spotlight. go awesome so um uh, one thing that i that i was very curious about throughout this whole thing is you know why did poor's management and ownership ignore the boycott for so long it seems like maybe it was a different time but it seems like a <laughs> pr nightmare um and something that went on for a very long time that they never it seems like they could have stopped it pretty quickly but so what what's up with that yeah, um, yeah. I mean, you're right. They they ignored the boycotts in the various moments when they emerged at first, or really dismissed them as like, oh, you know, these are just sort of some crazy people who don't like our beer, but our beer is so good that it sells itself. Um, quite notoriously, the company spent the least amount of money per barrel on advertising out of all of the big breweries um, in mid-century. So they really believe like, the crisp quality of Coors beer was enough to dissuade people from boycotting. Um, it wasn't really until the late 1970s that they brought in a, a more robust team of HR, not HR, PR folks. And I think then they realized that the boycott was a problem. Um, it wasn't actually going away. In fact, it was getting worse and worse. And, and so once they brought in a team of, I think, trained professionals, they did get better at counteracting the boycott. Uh, but it certainly was a very slow process. And at times, if the company executives, especially Joe or his brother, Bill Coors, said things publicly, they often made it worse. Um, they often exacerbated the boycott by um, saying you know, racist things in public. Um, or expressing more publicly their deep conservatism. So um, yeah, it lasted a long time, I think, because of oversight, uh, maybe some ineptitude on the part of the company and just responding, uh, and then the habit of the executives to make things worse when they didn't need to. Uh, this is a good follow-up question from Stephanie F. in the chat. Uh, she's asking, to what degree was Coors impacted financially from the boycott? 
Yeah, that's a great question, Stephanie. It's it's really hard to assess the financial impact of any boycott um, because especially at this time, the Coors Brewing Company was competing really heavily with a couple other big breweries. And this is an era known, where, of, known for consolidation and competition. And so the company um, would claim that their lost revenue was because of competition and not the boycott. We can see that sales in certain areas drop significantly. Um, now, of course, I can't remember the percentages off the top of my head, but um, sales of Coors Beer in San Francisco, for example, drop um, a significant amount from year to year as the boycott is picking up. Um, so we do see that they're losing revenue. At one point, the company does have to lay off employees and they do blame that on the boycott to sort of deflect, I think, responsibility. Um, otherwise, I mean, as I mentioned, I, I think we all see like Miller Coors still is a one of the biggest breweries in, in the game. Um, they're not owned by the Coors family anymore. They've been eaten up by Miller and somebody else that I can never remember. Um, so in that regard, like the boycott isn't successful because it doesn't really make a huge impact in that way. Um, but it's really hard to know. It's, it's hard to figure out those numbers, I think. Yeah, we have another question from the chat and this is a good question. Uh, did other breweries use the boycott of Coors uh, politics as a selling point for their beer or did they use did anybody even point out the ownership's politics as a selling point? Uh, yeah, that's a great question, Christian. They would do it, other breweries would do this kind of subtly because, for example, with Anheuser-Busch, the Bush family was also pretty conservative, same for like the Miller family. So it, I don't think they wanted to bring attention to their own politics, but what they would do is take out ads every Labor Day in labor newspapers, for example. Uh, to, to appeal to, to unionists and say, hey, our beer is actually union made now after you know, the 1980s. And these other breweries were able to kind of make headway into other communities as the boycott, of course, was, was building steam. And uh, uh, to what, this is again from Stephanie. Thank you for the question, Stephanie. Uh, to what degree do you think the boycott has affected Coors' images, uh, image today? Hmm. Yeah. Um, yeah. Great question, Stephanie. Thank you. Uh, I think that Coors's image today it probably seems rather unscathed. Um, depends, however, on the community in which you're discussing the company. I always find that, especially among queer activists, the, the company is still known as the company that was boycotted, right? It's known for these associations with conservatism, Every once in a while, I'll, I'll meet people who kind of repeat the old talking points, uh, but it's more on an individual level or a local level. Uh, Coors has done an incredibly impressive job at remaking its image. Um, most notably, the Pride Parade in Colorado every year is sponsored by Coors. Uh, so it has positioned itself as a really responsible, um, kind of progressive company. And I think that it did that Actually, I don't think that I did that. I argue this in my book, uh, that over time, that kind of pressure forced the company to, to repackage and resell itself, right? Um, so the company actually looks better now than it did in response to the boycott. Um, and I think they wouldn't have made those changes if they hadn't been consistently pressured by activists over the course of many decades. They, they never say that that's because of the boycott. They say, that's we just know we're a good company, we're progressive. Uh, but they don't start to make those turns until they really start to see the pressure of the boycott. <laughs> uh, 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 just a, a side comment, and I agree, this yeah. is from Christian as well. He said, I was clueless about this history, and I bought a lot of Coors in my younger days. Um, I was also uh, clueless about this, too. I didn't buy any Coors, I can say that. I've never been a Coors guy, but um, I, I, I agree that it doesn't seem as widely remembered in like the general zeitgeist. Again, granted mm -hmm. that I'm, you know, a white cis male. So maybe that from the East, so that might have something to do with it. Um, but why does this not seem to be as widely remembered amongst the general mm -hmm. public? It seems like it went on for such a long time. It surprises me. Yeah. Yeah. I, I agree. I think, 
that's been one of the big puzzles for me. I mean, I think too about myself, like I grew up in Colorado and I didn't, didn't that this history didn't touch me um, in any way until I read about it in a textbook. So um, I think there are two reasons for this. One is that a big pitfall of a boycott is not messaging the appropriate end to a boycott. Like the problem with the Coors boycott was there was a lot of grievances against Coors, but there was no agreement on when the proper end point of this thing would be. Like, do we end when they finally give us a bunch of money? Do we end when they sign affirmative action agreements? Or do we just wait till the company goes out of business? And certainly there were some people who wanted that. And, and so there was a lot of organizing and rhetoric around the reasons to boycott, but less so about the end of the boycott. And so the boycott always ended in disputes and divisions. And, and I think because of that, and because it didn't seem to make a, you know, a huge impact on the company beyond the company changing its branding, the, the overall historical narrative has just kind of dissipated since the 1980s. Um, although it depends here in Los Angeles, I will always meet somebody, especially older Mexican Americans who remind me that there was boycott on course. Um, so because it was also regional and where the company distributed, I think that also plays into it a little bit. Yeah. And was the intersectionality of the groups involved in this boycott part of what makes it unique or special? Or is this something that we see in a lot of different boycotts throughout U.S. history? I think it makes it unique or special. I, uh, many boycotts um, in U.S. history have been really centered on labor activism, right? So they've emerged from a strike and the boycott has only spoken to working class people. Like, you know, if, if you're in a union, you need to defend your union rights by boycotting this other company. Um, similarly, racial justice boycotts like the Montgomery bus boycott um, has really appealed significantly to, you know, people in the, in the community who are affected by the problem. Um, I think that by the late 20th century, the boycott as a tool expands to be more intersectional in its organizing. Uh, certainly other boycotts like the farm workers or the Farah pants boycott attempted to appeal to intersectional audiences, but didn't necessarily have intersectional organizing on the ground. Mm. Um, and I, you know, I think there are a number of different reasons why it happens with Coors. I think because it's an identifiable, easy to recognize name on the can, um, it was easier to, to build that intersectional organizing into it. Interesting. And another question from the chat, which kind of brings us to the present day, which is good because I have some questions about mm -hmm. uh, more recent stuff. What are the working conditions like now at Coors or what is the, I guess, the company culture as well? Yeah. Um, so at the brewery itself, um, I'm not 100% sure. I mean, the company is rather closed off when it comes to talking about this history. Their records are not open to the public. So I was not able to see their archives. Um, I mean, Coors pays, has some of the highest paying jobs um, for the area in Colorado. And so it's a really attractive place to work. Um, once Miller acquired Coors, some of the Coors brewing facilities across the country are in fact unionized um, by Teamsters. Um, so it's sort of a patchwork, um, but the, the flagship brewery in Golden remains non-union today. Uh, one question I have is when we think about the First Amendment and we think about private companies having an impact on the First Amendment, we think about uh, social media, Twitter, Instagram, Facebook, et cetera, et cetera. Are there any companies beyond these social media companies that impact or even inappropriately restrict our freedoms in some way um, that people may not even know about or just mm. even their workers. Because I, I saw yeah. that sign and then your presentation said, you know, they made a complaint about freedom of speech, right? Mm -hmm. So are there any issues like that more recently? With the workers yeah, of the that's general a really public? Good question. Um, uh, that's a real, it's, I think that's a really important insight, Max, and it's a good question, right? Because cool, like in the case of Coors, it was, they were infringed upon employees' freedom of speech on the job because they basically said you can't talk about a union or you know something like that. Um, and then in their political activity, they engaged in um, activities that sought to res restrict freedom of speech 
um, like funding the Heritage Foundation meant funding efforts to, to like ban textbooks in certain Christian conservative regions. So in that regard, I think what comes to mind is, um, you know, Amazon's efforts to restrict freedom of speech in discussing um, unionization efforts. I'm trying to remember when this came out where, it, you know, it became clear they were banning certain words on the company's chat uh, platform like union or bathroom maybe even solidarity, right? So, um, you know, that Coors would have, I think, liked that kind of control when they were trying to fight unions in their facilities as well. And so I think their companies are attempting to do similar things. And because of the weakness of labor law, even though that's illegal under the First Amendment and under labor law, it's pretty easy for companies to get away with that. Are there any boycotts going on today that you're familiar with? Um, yeah, I mean, I think that the Chick-fil-A boycott continues, although not in an organized manner. Um, I think that's one of those that's like could really benefit from clear, clear rhetoric and clear um, sort of narrative positioning. I have seen, and this has been an interesting debate is, you know, I often see people say, yeah, uh, oh yeah, Christian notes Walmart and Hobby Lobby for similar yeah, reasons. Hobby Lobby is a good one, Christian. Yeah. Um, you know, there's been calls to boycott Amazon because of its anti-union efforts, like especially in Alabama, um, and even at the way it's pushing back against efforts in Staten Island. But there's been a lot of debate over this because workers at Amazon say, no, don't boycott. Um, so one of the things I think that's important to remember about a boycott is, yes, it's easy to do, um, but a boycott should never ignore the needs and demands of workers on the shop floor. Um, it should be led by people who either want the work or doing the work, um, and then we as consumers follow suit. Um, and that's just, you know, boycotts need to be well organized. Even if they're easy to do, they need clear language and endpoints and coalition building, I think, to make them successful. Hmm. So um, final question. Um, you've listed out a bunch of lessons. In fact, you just gave some right there that were pretty good. Hmm. Um, what are the top two lessons that activists today can learn from the Coors boycott? What are the top two things that if you're an activist today that you should take home to know mm. that will make your activism or your boycotting more effective today? Okay. The, that's a lot of pressure. The top yeah, two. Yeah, top two. Uh, <laughs> um, I think one of them is that, well, sort of what I said before, and I, I, I think this is a really key lesson that I learned from this research is that boycotts need to be well organized. Um, in the 1970s, this meant like you had to do more than putting a bumper sticker on your car um, because th that kind of signaling is not enough um, to build a, a campaign. And I think today it's the same as like, you can't just put a square on your Instagram page or whatever um, and think that it's over and think that you've done the thing. A boycott is more than just an individual action. It is collective action, I think, by definition, and it's collective um, expression of speech, right? So that's one thing. I, and a big lesson from the Coors boycott is that you have to agree on when you're going to end when you're going to end the boycott. Otherwise, it ends for you and it's, it's not satisfactory, maybe. Um, the other lesson, I think, is that boycotts are an incredibly flexible and persistent form of organizing. So maybe they sometimes seem vapid or individualistic for some of the reasons I already outlined. But if you think about the boycott, it's a tool that's been in American politics and activism from the beginning. With the Boston Tea Party, it wasn't called a boycott, it was non-consumption. Um, the late 19th century labor unions engaged in boycotts all the time. And then the courts attempted to strike them down over and over and over again. And so the power of the boycott winnowed but people kept up at it and, and that right has been sort of upheld by the courts. So the boycott is really flexible. It seems able to withstand a lot of different assaults by businesses and by the courts. And I don't know that we found the right way to use it in our present context, but I think that there's a lot of potential there for us um, when combined with other forms of organizing. I know I said that was my last question, but one quick follow-up. <laughs> has the internet changed boycotting in a substantial way? I think so. Yeah. Um, I think that it has made it easier to make an argument for a boycott, but I also think it has made it too easy to call for a boycott without actually doing the work of organizing. 
That makes sense. Yeah. Um, but I think that it's an incredible opportunity because for Coors boycotters, all they could do was like put a little ad in a progressive newspaper and well, they did this in Maine and in Alaska and they would send records across the country and hope that people got the message and would send money their way or promote the boycott. And um, now you can spread the, the word and the movement more quickly, um, but you have to do it in an effective and thoughtful way. Awesome. Well, Professor Brantley, thank you so much. This is important history. This is great history. Um, do you have any way, any, any way that people can get a hold of this book? Yeah, it's available for sale anywhere. I mean, even on Amazon, but maybe if you're boycotting Amazon, you don't have to do that. Uh, the best place to get it is through the University of North Carolina Press. I think they have a 40% off sale. And um, one thing that I've done since the pandemic began is instead of, because I can't do in-person signings of books, I'll, I send a sticker, a book plate that I sign, uh, I can personalize for people. So you can find that link at my website, it's allisonbrantley.com. Um, and and the, the sticker has the fists from the cover of the book on it. So well, that's awesome. Um, I'm happy to send that to anybody. That's super cool. Awesome. And again, thank you so much. Like I said, this was great. This history is important and it was eye-opening for me. So I'm sure other people enjoyed it as well. Thank you so right. much. Thanks for having me. Thanks everybody for being here. Yep. Have a good one.